This is Joanne Culbertson Jeffries on June 14th, 2022 at 11.08 a.m. Mountain Time. Lane, thank you for agreeing to be recorded for the oral history collection of the Washke Museum and Cultural Center in Worland, Wyoming. We have two goals in these interviews. First, that our class of 1960 tells what life was like for the kids and teenagers in Worland from about 1941 to 1960. Second goal is that we are sharing how growing up in Worland impacted our adult lives. Can you please tell us your full name, including your maiden name? Lane Bailey DeFries. Was there another name or nickname that you were known by during your Worland years? Yes, I was known as Bonnie Bailey. And when I became an adult, I just eliminated the first name legally. And I now go by Lane DeFries, my middle name. Lane Fries, beautiful. What are you doing now as you make this recording? I'm retired as um, a teacher in the Denver area and just returned from this wonderful reunion in Worland, Wyoming, where um, our classmates were together and reflecting so frequently on the memories that we had of those four days together. See, if you weren't born in Worland, how old were you when your family arrived? And when did you leave Worland? Oh, I was born at the old Worland Hospital on Coburn. And the only years we were gone were during the war years when my father was called up. And as many mothers did in Worland who were not from that area, they took their children with them and went back to their family homes. So we were in North Dakota from the time I was an infant until maybe about three years old. And then we came back to Worland. If you moved to Worland, um, what brought your family to Worland originally? Oh, this is so fascinating. Um, my father grew up in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and he was in college at the time the Great Depression hit. And unfortunately, my grandfather was the banker whose bank was closed. So my dad had to leave college. And my grandfather found out from a traveling salesman, believe it or not, <laughs> that there was a job opening at the Washke Trading Company in Worland, Wyoming. And my grandfather put my dad on the bus and said, here you go, son, good luck. Oh. <laughs> and off he went, he was probably 20 years old at this time, landed in Worland and I think Worland at that time must have been just many, many young people had come in the late 30s to Worland. And he chose to stay there for the rest of his life. What did he do at the Washke Trading Post? Oh, I'm not sure what he did. He probably was a gopher, who knows? Oh. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> Mrs. Hampton, I understand, was rather difficult to work for. <laughs> <laughs> but he was glad to have a job. <laughs> Lane, um, was your home actually in the town of Worland or did you live outside of the city limits? And if so, where? Oh no, I lived right in, in town on 7th and Grace. But I remember thinking Worland was the whole community of the countryside as well as the city. And we often, as we've talked about at the reunion, many of us rode our bikes out to the country and we considered that our backyard too. And so when you close your eyes, what do you remember about those sights and the sounds that as you rode your bike out through your neighborhood or maybe downtown in the surrounding areas, what do you remember? You know what um, still triggers my memory are the sound, the bird sounds. I can hear a meadowlark singing and it just causes me to pause and have such joy. And the same with the blackbirds. You know, we, we had so many blackbirds that resided. Yes, there, all different and, kinds. Yeah, and just to hear those bird songs, I'm just reminded of 
the beauty of our community. Well, thank you, Lane. Now you've chosen a couple of topics that you would like to share with everybody. We will go in a chronological order to make it easier for those listening to follow and then to take a look back from your adult perspective. Um, what do you remember about your childhood when we were in elementary school, which would have been approximately 1948 to 1954? Well, I'll long remember an article I wrote for the Northern Wyoming Daily News. Getting that news subscription was really important in our family and we did a lot of, we always read it from cover to cover. And one summer, um, they were having difficulty getting enough news to print because people were out of town, clubs weren't meeting, it was really much quieter in the summer than during the year. So somebody came up with the idea, if, if people would submit articles for publication, uh, their name would be put into a, a box and there would be a drawing. And the winner of the drawing would get tickets to the Kirby Theater. Oh, oh yes, so I was probably maybe the summer after fifth grade, I decided to write an article. Well, they published it. It was the headlines in the society page. It was called <laughs> New Club Organized. And this organization <laughs> met at the home of Mrs. Robert E. Bailey. <laughs> and I told who came what we did, the refreshments that were served, and I made the whole thing up. <laughs> and, the, and the morning it was published, I could hear these footsteps coming up the wooden steps to the bedroom, and I knew something terrible had happened. And here was my mother. She burst into the bedroom. She was waving a copy of that newspaper right in front of my face, and she said, how could you do this? Everybody in town will know this is fictitious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how wonderful. I was in so much trouble. But I remember May Vaz, she knew about it. And, and the next time I saw her, she was just kind of laughing like this. She thought it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to make a, pe a penance or? retract the story? No, they didn't because it was already published. So there oh. it was out. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful memory, Lane. But I wasn't the winner of the drawing for the theater ticket. So it was all for naught. All for me. <laughs> Lesson learned, right? Yeah. What a wonderful memory. What about your time in seventh and eighth grade, which would have been like September of 1954 to May of 1956. Teachers were, were very appreciated in our community at that time. And I remember Elsie Huffman and Omer Huffman lived on a farm outside of Worland and they had four daughters in the school system and mother and dad had three children in the system. And the two moms, Elsie and my mother, decided that they would put on a dinner and invite every teacher and their spouse to come to this dinner. And it was the teachers of their children. And they held it at our home and it was a very small home. So they set up tables in the basement. <laughs> they set up tables in the living room and in the kitchen and Elsie had these fresh chickens from the farm. They fried chickens. I don't know how many chickens they did. And they had mashed potatoes and gravy and green beans and jello salad and fruit salads and pies and cakes. And they put everything out on the kitchen counter. And as the teachers came, they could just help themselves and choose the table to sit, sit down at and 
and it was done in appreciation for them. There was nothing expected in return from our moms. It was just a joyous time to thank them for their service to their children what, and the other children in the community. What a wonderful act of love and kindness that they have. Yeah. Were the, would, did you have a good participation? Oh, did the teachers yeah. all come? They did. Oh my goodness, yes. And, and they, everybody seemed to be having a good time. Oh, wonderful. That's, that's a good story. Now, you've reminisced about elementary and junior high. What about your high school years from 1956 to May of 1960? One of the wonderful things I remember about Worland was the giving of our parents. Our parents were, at that time, there was a great deal of concern for community as well as for an individual family. It was everybody else's family and how to strengthen the community. And we had many parents who were busy, but they volunteered to be Girl Scout leaders, 4-H leaders, Cub Scouts, Brownies. They helped in the schools. They did whatever they could. And for years, um, our school leader was our, I was in 4-H, and Mary Ujifusia volunteered for years to do uh, a 4-H club we called it Town and Country. We met at her home once a week, all summer long, and we were there all day. How she did this, I don't know. She was a busy farmer's wife. <laughs> she made time for us. And it was called Town and Country. That was the name of our 4-H club. And one year, Jackie Hampton and I won the purple ribbon in the 4-H uh, fair, which meant we could go to the state fair. And we were so proud of our dresses. Um, and we were to model them in a style show in Douglas, Wyoming, where they had the state fair. So Louise Hampton offered to take Jackie and me and this was such a remarkable outing for me. We stayed in a, in a motel. <laughs> we modeled our dresses. And there was a carnival associated with the um, fair. And Louise was determined that I was going to win a stuffed animal. And we <laughs> sat there. <laughs> she was putting in nickels and dimes until... I won this black poodle <laughs> and Jackie won a stuffed animal and that that was the highlight of the summer. What a how wonderful do you still sew? I do mainly repairs but I could sew if I needed to. Yeah. Lane, thank you for sharing your elementary, junior high and high school experience. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about? Yes, I would. I'd like to talk about the influence that um, our mothers, the positive influence our mothers had on us um, in relationship to um, being homemakers and then being career women. And when, when mother came to Worland, she taught, she was hired to teach and as a single woman. And the rules were you could not be engaged, you could not be married and be a teacher. So she had to resign after she and my dad were married. So she was the homemaker as were all the other, many, many other women who stayed at home and they did a lot of volunteer work as I mentioned earlier. But then there came a time in the fifties when there was a teacher shortage. And Frank Watson was the superintendent of schools. He had to decide how he was going to fill all these empty slots. And he was desperate one December when he found out that the fifth grade teacher's husband um, had received a transfer and that they would be leaving immediately. So he was brave enough. He called my mother and he said, I know it's been many years since you have taught but would you be willing to fill in? 
for this semester? She said, yes. She found out she loved the work. The school system found out that married women hadn't lost their brains and they could teach. <laughs> and <laughs> she was hired the next year as were other women of that age. So the problem was the, the teachers, uh, when they had been hired as young teachers, they had certifications after three years of study. So by the 50s, a fourth year was required. So the women who accepted these positions in the school, they had to figure out how they would get that fourth year of study. So some of them, um, well, I think all of them took correspondence courses. There were extension courses from the University of Wyoming. And then in the summers, they would have to leave and go to various schools. And I think it was three years for my mother to get her fourth year degree. But she finally did that and continued teaching and really did enjoy it. But I was thinking of the women our parents' age. And Joni, I know your mother went back to work. Um, May Voss, remember, opened the Montgomery Ward business. So it wasn't only just teachers. I think women in general in, in Warland were just prompted that it's okay, we can go to work and they were accepted. And that was, a cert they were certainly role models for us. The role of homemaker was truly an elegant profession, but it, it's amazing that it was about that time when we were young where women did start coming into their own and actually working mm -hmm. in the world of business or education, nursing, all different areas. Yeah. So, we're so Rosie great. the Riveter had an effect on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> In closing, for generations to come um, that have listened to your story many years from now, is there anything that you would like to pass on them? Any words of wisdom? What would you want them to know? I would want people to know how important it is to not only take care of your families, but have a sense of community about the community in which you live. And be active and care about it and try to support um, our schools, our politicians, our legislators, people that are nonprofit organizations and have a focus outside of ourselves. I think that's important. And we learned that, I think, early on in New Orleans by examples. Lane, thank you so much for sharing your experiences for the public about what it was like to grow up in Worland during our time from the early 40s until we graduated in 1960. I know this will be an eye opener for many of them. Thank you, Lane. You're welcome.